we're going to start a review of figurative language. Now, this should all be relatively familiar to you. However, if it is not, these are required components of literary analysis that we need to be able to look for. So you want to pay close attention. We start off, figurative language is made up of figures of speech. Basically, when we don't mean exactly what we say, we're using a figure of speech. One of my favorites is Amelia Bedelia. That in and of itself is not a figure of speech, but Amelia Bedelia exemplifies all of the different types of things that we look for with our figures of speech. Let me explain. The first example we have of Amelia Bedelia using uh, or introducing us to figurative language and figures of speech is an example from one of my favorite books. And in this book, she goes camping and she is supposed to be pitching the tent. Well, you and I know that pitching the tent means we should be setting up the tent, but to pitch is actually to throw. So in this illustration, she's actually throwing the tent inside of the bag, right there, instead of uh, actually setting it up for use. Funny? Yes. Actually helpful? Not so much. Here's another Amelia Bedelia example. If she was told to clean the vegetables and wash the vegetables, she actually did that in the sink. And then her list told her that day to uh, use string beans. So string beans we know are green beans, but she realized they didn't have any string in them, so she added some string herself. One of my personal favorites is when Amelia Bedelia is somehow asked to be a substitute teacher. And her directions tell her to call the roll, which we know means that she should take attendance and see who is absent or who is present. But she gets a roll and literally puts it on the floor and calls it, roll, hey roll. And of course the roll doesn't do anything because it's just a roll. One more little Amelia Bedelia example before we move on. Here, her list told her to make the bed. Again, that for us means that we should put uh, clean sheets on it, wash the old sheets, make sure that the fitted sheet is on, the regular sheet is on, the comforter, pillows, but no, she literally constructs a bed. So funny. So I know those were all from children's books, but they can still mean a lot to us and we can learn from them even as we get older. So Amelia Bedelia is full of figures of speech. The point behind that being that if you were to take everything that we say literally instead of figuratively, we would mean something very different from what we actually say a lot of the times, which is one of the things that actually makes English a difficult language to understand. It's not necessarily that difficult to learn the words or how to pronounce them, but the way in which we use our words confuses a lot of students who, um, and people, I shouldn't just limit it to students, but people who are learning English later on in life as a second language. Our figures of speech are confusing. So what are we talking about? First and foremost, things like similes. Similes use like or as to compare to things that are not alike. So one example of that would be to say he is sick as a dog. A simile uses like or as. So here, he is as sick as a dog. It's comparing him to a dog. Now why you would say that he is sick as a dog, I don't know. But we have come to mean that they are very, very sick. Another simile we use is when we say I'm as busy as a bee. This one makes a little bit more sense to me because you never really see bees have downtime. We see them always moving from one flower to another flower and working, which is why most of the bees we see are worker bees. But this one makes a little bit more sense than the last one. Both are similes, 
Let's see if we can find one that uses like. Here's an example of a simile that uses the word like. He's sleeping like a log. Here the comparison is being made between a person sleeping and a log. Not exactly sure, except for the fact that logs don't move on their own. So if you're sleeping like a log, you are immobilized, perhaps. You are sleeping very soundly. The most important thing to remember, however, is that you need to not only identify the word like or the word as, because I can say I like pizza. I didn't make a comparison. I could say that I write you a note, as soon as you get this message, please call me. And I didn't make a comparison. So just the words like or as don't necessarily mean that you have a simile. You have to actually have the comparison. Keep an eye out for that. Haha, <laughs> more figurative language. Similes and metaphors are often confused because they both do create a comparison. However, a metaphor doesn't use the words like or as to do so. You're just simply saying one thing is another thing. That's kind of vague as far as a description, but let's see what we can do about that. If we say to someone, you have a heart of gold, this could be an example of a metaphor because you're comparing their heart to a precious metal. Gold is a precious metal. So the comparison that you're making is their heart is valuable, it is uh, beautiful, it is probably clean, and that's kind of a little bit weird. But by clean, we mean pure. So the implication is that you have no bad intentions by saying someone has a heart of gold. Now, you can also have some metaphors that could almost be slightly reworded to actually be similes, and we use them that way sometimes. So this example is written as a metaphor, but you could easily change it into a simile, which is why it can be so confusing. Rupert, a young boy from the farm, is a duck out of water in the big city. So by saying he is a duck out of water, there's no word like and there is no word as, as far as the comparison goes. So there is still a comparison that he, in the city, is similar to a duck when it's not in water. The implication being that ducks belong in the water. He's from a farm, he does not belong in the big city. If we wanted to turn this into a simile, we would simply say, Rupert, a young boy from the farm, is like a duck out of water in the big city. Then it would be a simile, but without the word like, it's just a metaphor. Irony is one of my favorite figurative uh, pieces of figurative language because it's funny. Usually the examples are kind of hilarious. so. When we're talking about irony, you can, you can have different types of irony. So just like you, I need to give credit where credit is due. I found this little bit that we're going to go through next on slideshare.net. So this is not my own stuff, but it's pretty good. Let's check a look. Or take a look. Checking a look doesn't make any sense. Here they define irony as the opposite of what is expected, which is what we talked about. But there's three different kinds of irony. There's verbal, traumatic, and situational irony. So verbal irony, I don't know if any of you have ever uh, paid attention to comic strips in uh, the newspaper, but it was something that I personally loved. And this is from Hagar the Horrible. Um, <laughs> So verbal irony is when you say one thing but mean the opposite of that. So really anytime you're sarcastic, you can also say that you're using verbal irony. So in the cartoon we have, I'm taking off on a raid, do you want anything? And his wife says, yes, bring me back a husband who doesn't go off on raids. And then as he's walking away he says, I never know when she's kidding. So here are a couple more examples. Um, for you to look at for that, but verbal irony is sarcasm. You guys are all really good at that, so great job. You already know how to do verbal irony. Dramatic irony is when you have a 
great uh, understanding of something. You're let in onto information that the characters themselves don't know. So the example is, here we go, Charlie Brown. I'll hold the ball, and you come running up and kick it. We know that Lucy is going to pull the ball out from under Charlie Brown, and he never, ever gets to kick the ball. She promises every time, and he never gets to kick the ball. For situational irony, this is the kind that we're mostly going to see in our literature, because it's when the outcome of a story doesn't end the way that you'd expect. It's the opposite. So there's a story by a guy named Guy de Maupassant, who's French, duh, um, based off of the way I said that. But in the story, there's this woman named um, Mathilde, and she borrows her friend's necklace to go to this thing. And she um, she loses it, and she doesn't know what to do, so she buys another one of what she thinks the necklace is, and then spends the years and years of her life paying off the cost of what she thought was this really, really valuable necklace. They meet up again years later, and um, Mathilde confesses that she had lost the necklace and has been working hard for all these years to try to pay off the debt that she incurred when the necklace uh, was replaced. And her friend, who she thought was very wealthy, says, oh my gosh, no, that was, that was all costume jewelry. It was so cheap. So that is situational irony. So sometimes images can represent irony too, and here's an example of an ironic image, not a funny image, um, but an ironic image of you wouldn't think that a fire truck would be able to catch fire, but here it is. What's the saying? Um, irony is all around us. That's not actually a saying, but I want to get it to be a saying. So work with me here, people. Next, we're going to talk about personification, but we're all going to talk about it in context of personification versus anthropomorphism, because you've always been taught that personification describes something non-human with human characteristics, but we tend to think or include when those things actually come to life, and that's not actually true. So first, let's start with examples of personification. So one example of personification would be to say the wind whistled as the snowstorm raged in the sky. Here, obviously, the wind is not actually whistling because it's not a real character. It's depicted as such in the picture, but that's not anything. So when we talk about personification versus anthropomorphism, we need to be able to tell the difference. So I wanted to try to come up with an example that I could actually show you some little clips of. So if you want to personify trees, you would say the trees danced in the wind. What you're trying to say is the wind is strong enough and the trees are light enough that the leaves and the branches maybe even are moving. This is what that looks like. Anthropomorphism, on the other hand, um, is when the trees would actually be characters and would actually come to life. So the example I have is from The Lord of the Rings. I love The Lord of the Rings. We did watch some clips earlier this year, um, but it's great stuff, especially for figurative language. Um, so in the story, there's a whole forest of trees that come to life, and one of them is a guy, uh, well, a tree named Treebeard, and he ends up carrying Pippin and Mary. So in this instance, Treebeard is alive. He's animated and actually acting like a human. So this is what that looks like.
The next few that we're going to go over, uh, people also do confuse some of, and I'm not 100% sure why, but they're really kind of close. So hyperbole is when we use an exaggeration. We're trying to emphasize a fact, sometimes we're adding humor, but it's about exaggeration. So here are some examples of hyperbole. <laughs> to be able to say your feet are killing you, we mean our feet hurt, but this silly little uh, example that I found shows the feet actually trying to poison you. Not funny, except for your feet really can't do that. Here are a few more examples that I found uh, in my Google search. You can see that there is definitely an exaggeration um, in each of these. Now, I argued not actually argued, with one of my classes. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Some people consider this hyperbole. Some people consider it an idiom. And this is where we get confused. A hyperbole is an exaggeration. But an idiom is we're not saying exactly what we mean. Now, a lot of people think that this is hyperbole because you're exaggerating that you could eat an entire horse. But I can see that it is an idiom because even if we're that hungry, we don't ever intend to eat a horse. I think I'm in the court where I would say that this is more an idiom than a hyperbole because even if I'm ridiculously hungry, I might eat like an entire pizza or I might eat cheeseburgers, but you wouldn't catch me eating horse. I think this falls more into idiom. What do you think? So that's where idioms come in. Idioms are when we actually speak without saying something that we expect people to take literally. Now I know what you're thinking. Obviously, a lot of these figures of speech you're not expecting people to take literally. But hyperbole, if you say, I called you a million times last night, you actually attempted to make a call. Um, whereas here, in an idiom, you would say something like, if we're telling someone to zip their lips, we're telling them to close their mouths and not say anything. While this is a funny image, and I've actually never thought of it this way, when people say they woke up on the wrong side of the bed, I usually think like people have a preference for one side or the other, and so they woke up on the side they didn't prefer, but this is a super funny illustration because he's actually under the bed. So that's another example of an idiom. What you really mean to say is the person is really cranky. So idioms are also called colloquialisms because they usually tend to be specific to a culture. So we have idioms that make sense to us. And this one I found is Russian. So apparently in Russian, if you say it a ride as a hare, however you'd say that in Russian, it means that you'd be traveling without a ticket. So somehow saying into the mouth of a wolf in Italian means good luck. I guess it's similar to in Americanized English anyway. I can't speak for English elsewhere. Like saying break a leg to someone when they're about to perform. We don't actually want them to break a leg. We are trying to say good luck. This one is absolutely hilarious to me because everyone knows I love monkeys. But if you say not my circus, not my monkeys in Polish, it means that's not my problem. As you can see with some of the idioms that we just looked at, they won't necessarily make sense if you don't have the same cultural background. And I found this one as well, so I wanted to share it even though we're not going to go through every single one of these. Here are several more examples of different types of idioms. Again. If you say these things, would people who are not from around here be able to understand what you meant? Probably not. Now we're going to talk about illusion. Illusion, not illusion with an I. Illusion is from the word to elude or to reference, whereas illusion is like magic tricks, sleight of hand, things like that. So. Allusions are when we allude to or reference usually 
uh, a person, place, or thing that's from another work of literature, history, um, mythology. The reason those are chosen is because they should be well known. Sometimes those are also culturally based, but the goal of a really good illusion is that it should be something that most people will actually be able to recognize the connection that you're trying to make. Illusion can also tie in with similes and metaphors because you can say someone is like something or he's a Hercules and you're actually making an illusion as well as the metaphor or the simile. So here's another example that I found here um, which gives us some examples of some common biblical illusions. Now whatever your religious beliefs, biblical illusions are commonplace because of the spread of Christianity over time through um, the Crusades, through um, all of the different things throughout history where uh, imperialism and trying to indoctrinate other cultures uh, came into play because not only were you putting control uh, over that land monetarily and through your hierarchy, but you were also imposing your religious beliefs. That doesn't necessarily mean that those people ended up actually believing what you believe, but your stories would have been passed on to those particular groups of people. So no matter what you believe, it's kind of important to be able to at least be familiar with some biblical references because tons of literature will make a whole lot more sense once you understand those kinds of things. So here are a few. Um, if you say to someone his life was like that of Job's, the story of Job is all about how Job was um, completely tested, broken down monetarily, physically. Uh, it was all to show his intense faith. Um, but everything was stripped from him. It was a horrible, horrible life. Everything was taken from him. So this kind of illusion can either reference um, that he's had that kind of loss, or theoretically, if you wanted to reference his faith in whatever it is, that he's that steadfast, that trusting, you could also make an illusion there. Harriet Tubman, um, famous for uh, her work with the Underground Railroad. If you don't know what that is, you will learn it in history class, but um, they, the short end of it is that um, people were trying to be free from slavery in the South specifically, and um, Harriet Tubman was one of the people who helped um, people move secretly not actually an Underground Railroad, there were not subway systems at this time, but that's what it was called, to get to the northern states and or Canada, um, where they would be able to have freedom. So because of that, she is called the Moses of her people. Why? Moses was the one chosen to lead uh, his fellow Jews out of slavery. And this one is kind of hard to see, but in this quote, um, Patrick Henry talks about um, the warning of a betrayal by a kiss. Another biblical illusion would be that Judas betrayed Jesus by identifying him as he went up to him and gave him a kiss. And that's when Jesus was taken um, and then eventually, you know, died on the cross, all of that stuff. Okay, so anytime you hear someone as tilting against windmills, it's a quote that is referenced to Don Quixote by Cervantes, where his character was this crazy dude who thought he was a knight, and he rode away on his donkey, which he thought was this noble steed, and it was Rocinante. Uh, it actually will come up in, in play if you ever read Travels with Charlie by John Steinbeck. But um, 
one of the things that Don Quixote does is it's written that he tilts at windmills, but he thinks the windmills are giants and he's trying to fight them. So it's a ridiculous comparison. That's an example of a literary illusion. We had just talked about some biblical ones. This one's an example of a literary illusion. So this example I found is a historical illusion that's kind of funny. So you'd have to be able to get the reference um, by knowing who Marie Antoinette was and what her famous quote is or was. So by saying, can I have some of your peanut butter and jelly sandwich? All my mom ever gives me is cake. That's funny because Marie Antoinette is famous for saying, let them eat cake. And there's context behind that, but this is not history class. Ask your social studies teacher. Another, um, well, the Bible is not written by one author. So another um, type of illusion would be Shakespearean illusions. So Shakespeare was actually one author in theory, although there are other theories you might learn about in high school or college that multiple people might have been quote-unquote Shakespeare. But let's just say Shakespeare was one dude. And um, he wrote a ton of plays and poems and um, is well quoted because, again, um, his works have been around for a really long time. And they've influenced other works. Not just the quotes that we have here, but also there are movies, entire movies, that are based off of his original works. They're almost retellings. Anytime there's a retelling, that provides illusion as well. So, some famous, famous quotes. Um, to be or not to be, that is the question. That's from Hamlet. Hamlet's questioning life or death. So, anytime you see that or hear that, it's from Hamlet. You know, there's a Shakespeare reference. Parting is such sweet sorrow is from Romeo and Juliet. And it's a very interesting quote because Romeo and Juliet is meant to be a tragedy. A lot of people think of it as a love story, but it's actually the tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. Um, so, yeah. Um, if you say it was Greek to me, um, Casca says this to Brutus in Julius Caesar. Um, Brutus is uh, Caesar's theoretical best friend, but he does help kill him. Spoiler alert. And it literally means that Casca did not speak Greek. But when we say, oh, it was all Greek to me, or that's Greek to me, we mean we don't understand. All the world's a stage is from As You Like It. And um, I think it's the band, yes. All the world's a stage and we are merely players. Um, they actually quote Shakespeare in that song. Um but this is that we are all acting in some way, shape, or form. Take that for what you will. To say all that glitters is not gold, you'd have to understand the Merchant of Venice, where greed... Sorry about that. Where greed pays, uh, plays a big role. And also recognize that gold in and of itself is, does not uh, glitter. So that's somewhat ironic as well. So, to thine own self be true. This is, you want to um, be honest and be true to yourself. It's a Shakespeare reference. So, we are not going to go through all of these, but I do encourage you to take a look at some of these classic literary illusions. Um, some to point out, Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, comes from Robert Louis Stevenson's uh, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And this is really the idea of um, split personality or that, not even split personality, that you can be a really nice person or also really evil and malicious. To call someone a Scrooge, you don't even have to call them an Ebenezer Scrooge. You're referencing uh, A Christmas Carol. And one of my favorite references is actually Scrooge McDuck from um, 
the DuckTales TV show that was on for, like, ever ago. You can look it up on YouTube. But that's an example of a Scrooge, someone who just uh, is very, very miserly with their money. They're stingy. Okay, so saying something's a catch-22 means it's a no-win situation. This book... Uh, is kind of complex so it's a great read but not one that I would recommend for right now so we're not going to spend too much time on that it's, it's complex this uh, referencing something as an albatross comes from a really really cool poem uh, it's an epic poem from Samuel Taylor Coleridge and it's the rhyme of the ancient mariner so an albatross is a sign of good luck but if you kill an albatross, it's meant to be a sign of bad luck or a bad omen. From kid stuff, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. That's Chicken Little. And that's where he believes uh, the world is coming to an end, but it's, it's referencing something bad is about to happen. So we cannot leave out mythological illusions because just like the Bible um, provides us a lot of Christian um, background, mythology is really, really important to both Greek and Roman culture. So they have also uh, had a great influence because they've been around for a really long time. So an Achilles heel is your weakness. Um, and that was because a Achilles' um, mother dipped him into the river Styx, but uh, she held his heel, and so that's his only vulnerable spot. To be Hercules, or to give a Herculean effort, as this thing says, Hercules was super, super strong and superhuman um, because he was the combination of the son of Zeus, head god, and a mortal woman. So he is both um, man and god. He's somewhat supernatural, and he mean it, anytime you hear someone referred to as Herculean, it means they're really, really strong. Hot is Hades. Hades is a reference to the Greek god of the underworld, and generally visualized with with flames. The Midas touch references the Greek myth of King Midas, where he got the ability to turn everything that he touched into gold as uh, uh, his wish being granted. However, he learned that having the Midas touch was not necessarily good. A Trojan horse. Now you're probably like, I think I might have heard of that before. Hmm. Here's an example of what one person thought the Trojan horse would look like. But this is more what it probably looked like. So the Trojan horse was sent in as a gift and they re So the Trojan horse was used by the Greeks as a way to trick the Trojans during the Trojan War. The Greeks sent this built-up horse as a gift and the Trojans brought it in to their very very walled-off city. Uh, thinking that everything was fine. And then um, during the night, the Greeks came out from inside of the horse and uh, started, or rather continued, their war. One of the interesting things about illusion, though, is it's not always written or spoken. Uh, there are also icons, if you will, Images, signs, even brands take their names from mythology. So Venus, Nike, the Olympics, Midas, Titans, all of these are examples of mythology being referenced or alluded to in uh, our everyday lives. Just like the biblical allusions, and the mythological allusions. There are also important historical allusions that we hear of in everyday life. So one of the most popular is 
calling someone a Benedict Arnold. If you call someone a Benedict Arnold, it's a reference to a guy named Benedict Arnold, who was a part of the Revolutionary War, and then he uh, traded sides, and he became, um, or he worked for the British. So to be a traitor is a Benedict Arnold. If someone ever calls you that, they're calling you a traitor. To call someone a Mother Teresa, um, Mother Teresa was um, a, a nun, but she lived most of her life taking care of other people out in the missions field. So to call someone a Mother Teresa is calling them uh, selfless and charitable. It's a good thing. There are a couple other things. Um, obviously, Casanova is just a womanizer. Um, the Great Depression is referencing the period of the late uh, 1929 stock market crash on into the 1930s and through the mid-1940s. From there, this piece also mentions Watergate and Waterloo, um, but those are, I think, a little more removed than talking about the Great Depression for us. So finally, we come to some fairy tale illusions, calling someone a Cinderella or identifying someone as Prince Charming, we automatically think of Cinderella. Um, and we talk about um, how someone has been mistreated or how someone comes to their rescue. The Cinderella would be the kind, selfless person who's been mistreated. Prince Charming would be the rescuer. If someone's an ugly duck duckling, that would come from that story, where um, in the story of the ugly duckling, they think he's ugly, but he's really a swan when he grows up and is, and is beautiful. So that is a reference to someone who may not be physically beautiful on the outside when they are younger, but they grow up and they, and they become uh, as beautiful on the outside as they are on the inside. Mentioned Pinocchio, you're talking about telling lies. Um, Beauty and the Beast, obviously there's the reference of the beast being um, someone that is gruff on the outside, whether physically or just um, relationally with people, and being tamed, if you will. So there are a few others, but I think The Boy Who Cried Wolf is definitely popular. If you say someone is like The Boy Who Cried Wolf, you got to know that you're saying that they are uh, in danger of having no one believe them, because that's what happened with The Boy Who, Who Cried Wolf. So I know this lesson is getting kind of lengthy, but I did want to give you a view of some slides that I found uh, that have some more information if you are interested in the difference between some of these things, these myths, uh, fables, fairy tales. This also includes tall tales and legends. So um, fables. Here's a brief introduction of these. Some examples for you to look up would be Aesop's Fables or The Tortoise and the Hare. Um, tall tales are things about like Paul Bunyan or um, maybe even Johnny Appleseed. Fairy tales and folk tales have some sort of oral tradition. Uh, to begin with, and fairy tales obviously would have some sort of mystical or magical quality to them. Myths um, tend to give somewhat of an explanation of how the world came to be as it is. These would also be called origin stories, and believe it or not, every single culture has their own type of myth or origin story. Pretty cool stuff. And finally, legends. Um, <sighs> legends get almost larger than life. Um, so you have the examples that they give you here are Beowulf or Robin Hood. Beowulf is part of the oral history of um, the United Kingdom, and it's a very, very interesting tale, but it's an epic poem originally. Hard to read in its original Middle English. 
Um, I believe it's Middle English, not Old English. And um, But in this, you have a history not of the origin of people, but it's almost like a war account, but it's blown out of proportion. And then, of course, the story of Robin Hood contains the ideal that um, someone would steal from the rich and give to the poor. Really cool ideas, but I wanted to throw these slides in there. I know they added an extra minute or so, but worth it if you want to stop and look back at them. So all of these things put together help create the imagery that the author, the poet, the writer needs to help you get a mental picture, a good visual of what they are trying to communicate, the world they're trying to create. So I hope this was helpful. I am going to go off on another little, but this one I promise will be actually a little, um, story on um, origin stories from around the world. But that will be saved for another time. Hopefully this is a good study tool for you. Don't forget your quiz on these particular things is Tuesday, Valentine's Day. It'll be a great day for a quiz.